This is our third one of these that we've had over the last few years, and uh, y'all know what I know. This room will fill up in the next 10 to 15 minutes uh, as people get off work and get kids to the right place. But we need to go ahead and start because our speaker has so much great content tonight. And I not only want to welcome you, but I want to welcome those of you who are at our Jersey Village campus and at our North Klein campus. Uh, we are super excited that y'all are joining us. We're simulcasting this to our other campuses, so everybody that's a part of Champion Forest uh, can avail themselves to this information. So Brett Moser is facilitating things uh, at Jersey Village, and Stephen Morris, I heard, was going to be facilitating things at North Klein. But, you know, I don't know if you all know this, Stephen Morris is the biggest Rangers fan I know, and so I doubt if he's there, he's probably home watching, watching the game. Um, our speaker tonight is Barrett Johnson. And Barrett is a longtime friend. We've been friends for over 20 years. And I'm excited that you're going to get to uh, learn from him tonight. Uh, he's been in ministry for over 30 years and uh, done student ministry, adult ministry, discipleship, and so forth. And for the last decade, Barrett has been focused on parenting and marriage and family matters, specifically, specifically as it relates to helping parents know how to talk to their kids about sex and technology. And so tonight, as we talk about the smartphone and how to help our kids navigate that, or our grandkids navigate that, this is Barrett's sweet spot. There's some resources over here. You can see the banner at the top, Info for Families, and that's the name of Barrett's website. Uh, for those of you at North Klein and Jersey Village, when he refers to resources that are, he brought some with him tonight, uh, you can pick those up or uh, purchase those, view those on the website as well at Info for Families. Dot com. Um, final thing is that at Jersey Village and North Klein and here, if you have a question that you would like to ask Barrett uh, while he's talking, just get up, walk to the back. We've got some index cards back there. You can write your question on the card uh, at the other campuses. Uh, there's some cards there available as well. And uh, Brett and Stephen will be facilitating that. And they're going to text us the questions. And we're going to get the cards from you here. At the end, Barrett's going to save some time so that we can uh, give you the chance to hopefully have your questions answered. Obviously, we can't answer everyone's question, but uh, please ask the question if you have it, and we'll be sure and get those to Barrett because we want to help you be the best parent or grandparent or guardian that you can be. Uh, I want you to meet Bo Patterson. Bo is uh, our new uh, minister, pastor for adult ministries. And uh, Bo is responsible for a lot of things like this, working with our entire discipleship team. He's going to tell you about two other things specifically related to family ministry that, that are going to go on at all the campuses and then open us in prayer. And after that, Barrett, uh, we'll turn it over to you. All right. Hey, you might not even know it, but we are nine Sundays away from 2024. And so only eight from uh, Christmas, if you didn't know that already. And so we're starting to plan out 2024, and I want to give you guys a sneak peek of what we have in store for you. So first, we have an amazing marriage conference that we're going to host here uh, at this Champions Campus for all of our campuses to come to. It's going to be January 19th. And so we're going to be talking about a lifelong love and what that means is finding purpose above your marriage. And so looking at how your marriage can fulfill even kingdom principles and God's will for your life. And so just to give that extra energy into your marriage that you guys can live for a higher purpose. And the second thing is we want to continue resourcing you. So we've already planned our next parenting seminar in February. So just put those dates down with Jimmy Scroggins and Mrs. Jimmy Scroggins. Uh, it's going to be amazing. That's right. Kristen there. And so we want to always resource you. We want to always supplement what you have here at Champions at all of our campuses. But the number one thing we can do best for you is to help you find a life group. And so if you're still looking for a life group or you're looking at what are the newest groups available, simply text the word GROUPS to 77069. That's GROUPS to 77069, and you will find a list of all of our groups. If you come in person, you can even see what new groups. Just ask your greeters what's new around here that we can jump into. That would be the best way for us to help support you and encourage you as you grow closer to Jesus. Well, let's pray, and then we'll bring up Barrett. Lord Jesus, thank you for tonight. And Father, we ask that as we look at training the next generation, as we look at raising them up with your word, that we know there are different barriers and struggles than other generations have faced. So God, we pray that you would speak wisdom into our life. You give us eyes to see and ears to hear how we can impact our children 
for your son, Jesus Christ. So would you put your hand of favor and blessing on tonight and bless Barrett and bless us who are listening so that we can do your will. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, would y'all welcome Barrett Johnson up here. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, man. Good evening. Uh, we're at the tail end of about 10 years of longitudinal data regarding the impact of these little gizmos on our hearts, minds, relationships, and our world. About 10 years, solid. The seniors graduating from high school right now, particularly young people, they've grown up with these things as a part of their lives, a normal part of reality for them. 10 years of longitudinal data to see what impact it has on how they are today compared to what they're like before they had technology in their pockets. Uh, moms and dads, grandparents, can tell you this, all of the data we have is bad news. It's all bad news. So many things have resulted negatively from these beautiful, wonderful things we all have in our pockets. We could do a survey right now, I guarantee 100% of us are carrying around one of these guys right here, right? Because it becomes so invaluable to us. What we've got to figure out as parents, grandparents, those who lead kids, is how we help our kids to make the best of these tools that are available to them and not destroy their lives. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to look at some of this stuff. I've got a screen here. Look at, uh, I'm going to go through things quickly. For those of you guys who are listening to a translation, God bless you. I talk really fast. And when I'm excited about something, I talk even faster. And so we have a lot of ground to cover. We're going to go rapid fire. I hope and pray we can all keep up. This is my family. I put this picture up here just because my family is beautiful. Aren't they beautiful? It's a good-looking crowd. We have set, uh, five kids, uh, three in-law kids, uh, and then seven grandchildren. And I know what you're thinking. You're too young and good-looking to have seven grandchildren. You were thinking that, weren't you? Okay, whatever. My clan is great, and so I've loved helping my kids navigate this world and raising them and disciple them to love and follow Jesus. One thing that's been hard about raising these kids is technology being introduced to them as they were growing up. You may feel that likewise. Um, I have some things I want to do, but I want to go fast, and so I'm going to skip over a few things just because this is fun, it's interesting, but our time is short. I want to honor our time. Most of us are addicted to our phones. Your kids are addicted to their phones. We have this obsession with our phones. One study showed that the average person can't go more than eight or ten minutes without looking at their phone. Some of you hear me say that, and you're pulling your phones out to look at it right now. Because, oh, something, I'm missing out on something. Something's happening that I forgot to check or forgot to see or whatever else. It's a reality. Our kids are there. Now, the gal named Alexandra Samuel, who's a researcher, she said there are three types of digital natives, and that's what your kids are. Your kids are digital natives. Every one of us has integrated smartphones into our life. At some point or another, 10, 12, 15, 18 years ago, we got our first smartphone and we integrated it into our lives. Our kids, though, are digital natives. They have always had these things. My 10-year-old grandson knows how to use this thing better than I do. He's a digital native. But Alexander Samuel says there are three types of digital natives. They're orphans, heirs, and exiles. Orphans are those who are given tech access with little guidance. Exiles are those who delay technology access. That's a parent out there who says, uh, my kid's not getting a smartphone until they're 21. Anybody in the room? Yes? Good luck with that. If that's your goal, aim high. But it's been challenging for most of us. The goal is to craze digital heirs, those folks who know how to use smartphones and technology with wisdom and do not blow up their lives with these things. And so if our kids need these devices... But yet we know there's so much danger, which we're going to cover in just a minute, so many risks, what it does to their lives. How do we find the middle? How do we find this happy middle ground of balance of use this thing, but don't screw up your life? Because every one of our kids is going to have one of these things. How do we help them navigate it? So that's our objective tonight. So one thing I'd recommend is there, say this, is that for this generation of care parenting, there's this whole new brand new bucket of responsibility that is brand new to us that no one else had to deal with. For generations, for like epic generations, parents have had to deal with the same things over and over again. Parenting roles like uh, character. For thousands of years, parents have thought, I gotta teach my kids character. I gotta teach them social skills, how to get along with others, how to live a faith system in their minds for people of faith. Education, how do I get them to learn something that matters, and how do I develop a career path? Those are all things that for thousands of years, Parents have had these things in common. But you, you blessed few lucky people that are born and raised in this generation, have a new bucket. And my argument today is that that bucket is probably bigger and more significant than the other buckets. Why? Because that large bucket of managing technology, and parents disagree, it is exhausting to manage this stuff. 
but because that one bucket impacts all the other buckets, their faith, their social skills, their education, their career path, everything about them, it impacts. We've got to get dialed in why we're going to help our kids. So let's see what we're to cover today. In the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to blitzkick through the impact of smartphones. We're going to talk about help, how we help our kids navigate this stuff. And then we're going to talk about leveraging tech for our good. We may skip that part because we may run out of time. But we're going to do our best to fit it all in here together. So let's talk, first of all, impact of smartphones. Let's cover that quickly. Now, let's talk about the good, the value of smartphones for families. Let's just for a minute park it here and agree that smartphones are awesome. Safety. I love being able to reach out to my kids and know where they are at all times because I can track them, that little GPS feature on their phones. They can reach me when they need me. Keeps them safer. We love that. Connectivity. I can call my mom from Atlanta, Georgia anytime. I can get on FaceTime and see her face. I love that. Connectivity for our family. Convenience is a beautiful thing. The fact that we can have all this stuff accessed at our fingertips. Do you guys remember a day when it came time to go see a movie at a theater on a Friday night and you had to call the theater and listen to a recording? You remember how, like when dinosaurs roamed the earth? Or maybe read the newspaper and find that little box in the corner of the newspaper, like barbarians, and find a time? It was terrible, okay? Today, we have all these convenient features on our phones that is absolutely wonderful. And then fun. Do um, you remember taking road trips with your kids across country, vacation, before screens? Wasn't it awful? Today, we can give our kids a screen and say, hey, you know what? We limit our screen time every day. On this road trip across country, you can have as much screen time as you want. Just be quiet back there. And it's glorious what our kids can do on their screens. Love it. So again, let's talk about the impact. you got some sheets on your tables. It's probably on your seats. If you can't find one, you're probably sitting on it. So look underneath your bottom. A uh, little note-taking guide. We're going to fill in banks like crazy, covering a whole lot of ground. I hope and pray you can keep up. The impact on our kids' brains and learning. Complex thinking is out the window if our kids are learning to focus mainly on a screen in their pocket. For kids who are raised in the smartphone generation, complex thinking, analysis, philosophy, why I think the things I think and why people do what they do is out the window because everything comes to our kids via brief, short, 30-second, 60-second entertaining videos. And so they stop being able to think and analyze. Gone are the days when a kid can read an article and think, what do I think of that article? What do I think of the truth of that? What does that mean to me? Out the window. Sleep deprivation is a game changer. Most folks say that teenagers need somewhere between 8 to 10, even 11 hours of sleep at night. If a kid has a smartphone in their bedroom, I guarantee most of our kids are in bed, swiping, looking, scanning, Screening, looking, staying up till midnight, 1 a.m., looking for what else they can see on their phones. Because, again, that's what they're wired to do. They're not getting the sleep they need. And then there's the dopamine addiction part of this. And dopamine addiction is basically that part of our phones that when we get a notification or a message or something fun that we look at, our brain gets a little quick rush of, rush of dopamine. And it's seriously impacting our kids' ability to cope with the stress of life. There's a guy named Simon Sinek who writes and speaks about this. I'm going to show a clip of him because he captures this better than I do. Watch this. We know that engagement with social media and our cell phones releases a chemical called dopamine. That's why when you get a text, it feels good, right? So, you know, we've all had it where you're feeling a little bit down or feeling a bit lonely, and so you send out 10 texts to 10 friends, you know, hi, 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 hi. Because <laughs> it feels good when you get a response, right? Right? It's why we count the likes, it's why we go back 10 times to see if, and if it's going, if our, my Instagram is growing slower, I would, I, I, did I do something wrong? Do they not like me anymore, right? The, the trauma for young kids to be unfriended, right? Because we know when you get it, you get a hit of dopamine, which feels good. It's why we like it, it's why we keep going back to it. Dopamine is the exact same chemical that makes us feel good when we smoke, when we drink, and when we gamble. In other words, it's highly, highly addictive right? We have age restrictions on smoking, gambling, and uh, alcohol, and we have no age restrictions on social media and cell phones, which is the equivalent of opening up the liquor cabinet and saying to our teenagers, hey, by the way, this adolescence thing, if it gets you down... <laughs> but that's basically what's happening. That's basically what's happening, right? That's basically what happened. You have an entire generation that has access to an addictive, numbing chemical called dopamine through social media and cell phones as they're going through the high stress of adolescence. Why is this important? Almost every alcoholic discovered alcohol when they were teenagers. When we're very, very young, the only approval we need is the approval of our parents. 
And as we go through adolescence, we make this transition where we now need the approval of our peers. Mm -hmm. Very frustrating for our parents, very important for us. It allows us to acculturate outside of our immediate families into the broader tribe, right? It's a highly, highly stressful and anxious period of our lives, and we're supposed to learn to rely on our friends. Some people, quite by accident, discover alcohol and numbing effects of dopamine to help them cope with the stresses and anxieties of adolescence. Unfortunately, that becomes hardwired in their brains, and for the rest of their lives, when they suffer significant stress, they will not turn to a person, they will turn to the bottle. Pause it. <clears throat> Let me pause it right there. Did you catch the significance of that? Many people who don't have good coping skills turn to drugs or alcohol to learn to numb the pain of life. A whole generation of young people is learning to numb the pain of their stress of their lives, and our kids are under plenty of stress by going to a dopamine-inducing tool that's in all of their pockets. And unfortunately, that's causing them to not learn the basic skills they need to function socially as they need to. And again, I'm, I'm kind of being a bringer of bad news, not to be someone that scares us about everything related to this, but I want parents to be aware, all of us to be aware of the impact of this stuff and make sure our kids are not getting so far out of balance related to this stuff. Let's shift into worldview real quick. The impact on our worldview is huge. Uh, what's changed culturally is simply this. Every generation before ours, you could teach your kids a worldview, a belief system, a faith, if you will, and by and large, insulate them from arguing, competing viewpoints. Now again, as our kids get older, we expose them to what the world believes, help them to navigate that and know how to think and, and embrace their worldview as it relates to other things and other people. But now, in our world today, with these bad boys in everybody's pockets, every worldview on the planet is pushed to them. It used to be we had to go seek other worldviews. Let me Google some information on another worldview, how they see the world. But that's changed now. The algorithms of Instagram and TikTok and all these apps that our kids on, if, if they have one curious link or look at one little video that's pushed to them, suddenly the algorithm picks up and starts pushing more content their direction and more information in their direction. And so they're bombarded with a worldview that you as a parent are saying, this worldview they're embracing or seeing is crazy. It's why we know so many people in our world, you know kids, maybe kids of your friends, or maybe your own kids, who you say, I've raised them right in church with the right worldview, but yet they're believing stuff that's crazy. This is where they're getting their information from. It's pushing to them nonstop. And so content via social media legitimizes every worldview. With popular apps, content is not explored, it's pushed to you. And then finally, we're one generation away from entirely losing our faith. It's changed absolutely everything. I saw a Babylon Bee article the other day. You know Babylon Bee? It's kind of a satirical, comical uh, website, kind of like The Onion. Here was their headline the other day. I love this. Parents baffle that one hour of youth group a week, not effectively combating teens, 30 hours of TikTok. Parents are just baffled that their one hour of church attendance isn't competing with the 30 hours of TikTok their kids are getting. We should not be baffled by that. We should not be surprised by that at all. Let's keep going. A lot of information. I'm so sorry we're going so fast. The relational impact. Smartphones can either replace or they can enhance real relationships. Hopefully it, it enhances them, but it can replace them. For our teenagers, constant connection means constant Influence and, and pause with me and think about this for a minute. I grew up in the 80s. Any children of the 80s in the room? God bless us all. When I went to school, I was at school, and when I went home, I was home. And we had a family phone. We had one in the kitchen, and we had one in the master bedroom that some, for some reason we never touched. But that one phone in the kitchen was kind of the family phone. And I could call my friend, or I could call my girlfriend, I could get on that phone with her. You know, that phone had that 40-foot-long cord that was always tangly, you know, you're always... And I could even walk into a little room we had right there and close the door and kind of have a private conversation on that phone, a little cord limbo line stretched across the kitchen area there into that bedroom. But, but, but I could connect briefly, but it was always a short conversation. Because why? Because Dad needs to use the phone, get off the phone. Dad's expecting a call. There was no call waiting Caller ID was just a fantasy. None of this was available to us. And so we didn't have a long conversation. So when you were home as a teenager in those days, you were home. Today, our kids are constantly connected to their peers, to their friends, to all that's going on. Constant connection means constant influence. 
You know whose influence is minimized when that happens? Moms and dads. Changes everything. And final word, uh, it's easy for our kids to become isolated and less empathetic. In her book, uh, Reclaiming Conversation, MIT researcher Sherry Turkle uh, highlights in her research, she discovered that communication through screens, and it's not face-to-face, -face, picking up on body language and tone of voice, when all of our contact and communication is done through a screen, maybe even through emojis. I've seen my 16-year-old daughter have conversations with friends. The whole conversation is just symbols. I don't understand what's happening. But yet that's how she communicates. When our kids do that, they lose the ability to empathize. Some people say that our kids' generation is the least empathetic generation in the history of mankind. They don't know how to feel for the feelings and hurts and concerns of other people. They've lost it. Again, our kids' relationships are being impacted. There's the impact on our self-esteem. With self-esteem, the social order is right in your face. With, with uh, Instagram and with technology, with uh, Facebook, all these different things our kids are on. Social order is right in your face. What do I mean by that? Every teenager in history has always been concerned about where they fit in with their peers. Am I loved? Am I popular? How do I fit in the social order? But it was always kind of this nebulous, vague mystery of where I fit in. I'm doing my best. Today, the, the social order is right in our kids' faces. And so pick, pick a daughter like maybe mine, who is not the most popular kid on the planet, not the most beautiful person in the world's eyes, just an average kid. Kids like her, middle schoolers, high school girls, particularly girls, all over the nation tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock are going to get dressed for school and then take a selfie of themselves in the mirror before going to school. But you probably stick their tongue out. I don't know why. It's just a thing. She's going to post on Instagram. And in the course of the day, she's going to look and see what the comments she gets. And she'll look at the end of the day, I got seven comments. You look cute. Nice outfit. And I got 25 likes. Okay, that's my score today. And that girl's also going to look at the most popular kid in school and look at that girl who got 35 comments and 100 likes. And that little girl who compares herself to that other girl is going to go, okay, she got eight times as many likes and comments on her picture as I did. She must be eight times more valuable than I am. She must be eight times prettier than I am. The score is right there in our kids' face, the metrics of the social media stuff our kids are on. There's a brand new mention of bullying that's taking place. Bullying is no longer taking kids' lunch money on the playground or kicking certain dirt in somebody's face. Bullying is all online now, and it's subtle. It, it's not even insults. That can happen, but it's subtle. It's a, a girl's soccer team of 15 girls have him practice and take a picture of the whole team, put it on Instagram and tag nine of those 15 girls and don't tag the other six, leaving kids out. That's a form of bullying, and that can escalate to text groups where people are making comments and being critical of other folks and just being, being mean. That happens as well. And then FOMO is there as well. Who, what's FOMO, everybody? Fear of missing out. That's real for our kids. It's real for us. I mean, I'm a 55-year-old secure adult, and a buddy of mine from out of town came to town about a, three months ago, and uh, I didn't know he was in town because he got together with two of his friends that I'm kind of friends with as well. He knows them better than I know them, but the three of them, I saw on Facebook a picture of three of them on the fifth tee of a beautiful golf course in our area. Three of them playing golf together. Any golfers in the room? Jeff, how many folks typically play golf together in a recreational way? How many? Four. And here's a picture of three golfers, friends of mine, playing golf. I love play golf. I had the worst FOMO on the planet. Why didn't they call me? What's wrong with me? They don't like me. I slice everything off the tee. That's my problem. Whatever. FOMO is very real for our kids. Let's keep going. I know we're going fast here, folks. Are we keeping up okay? Doing all right? All right. Um, we're right here. Oh, there's a video. Another video here. This is uh, powerful stuff has been from the social dilemma on increase. Netflix. Everyone needs in to watch this video. Depression and anxiety for American teenagers, which began right around between 2011 and 2013, the number of teenage girls out of 100,000 in this country who are admitted to a hospital every year because they cut themselves or otherwise harm themselves, that number was pretty stable until around 2010, 2011, and then it begins going way up. 
it's up 62% for older teen girls. It's up 189% for the preteen girls. That's nearly triple. Even more horrifying, we see the same pattern with suicide. The older teen girls, 15 to 19 years old, they're up 70% compared to the first decade of the century. The preteen girls, who have very low rates to begin with, they are up 151%. And that pattern points to social media. Gen Z, the kids born after 1996 or so, those kids are the first generation in history that got on social media in middle school. How do they spend their time? They come home from school and they're on their devices. A whole generation is more anxious, more fragile, more depressed, they're much less comfortable taking risks, the rates at which they get driver's licenses have been dropping, the number who have ever gone out on a date or had any kind of romantic interaction is dropping rapidly. This is a real change in a generation. And remember, for every one of these, for every hospital admission, there's a family that is traumatized and horrified. My God, what is happening to our kids? I'm gonna stop it there. A recent study uh, done on Instagram said that Instagram is probably the worst for our kids' mental health. Uh, the study showed that it fuels loneliness and anxiety, re reinforces negative body images um, in significant ways, particularly for our teenagers. And, and it's interesting how we can, how much that affects us or how much it affects our teenagers can be a kind of a litmus test for how God-centric or how man-centric our lives are. If our lives are God-centric, the stuff when I compare to what I'm seeing on Instagram, my life to that life, if my life and my heart is God-focused, it really wouldn't matter that much. But if our hearts are man-focused, it does matter. It does bother us greatly. Just a fun little litmus test to consider how you and how your kids affect that kind of stuff. I'm going to zip through these little slides here because, again, I want to show on time. Uh, I should have done that earlier. Please forgive me. Let's talk sexual impact, which is no fun but real, and it's a space that we live in as we teach and work with families uh, big time. Know this about uh, technology and smartphones. Bottom line, smartphones are, by definition, porn delivery systems. Number one way to access pornography today is via a smartphone. Um, I, I will confess to you as a 55-year-old man in the midlife grandfather, when I was in my early teenage years, I had an acute interest in pornography. I'm sharing this out loud and my mom's on the third row. It's okay. It's all good. Um, I think most men in the room would recognize when you were a young person, you had an acute curiosity and interest in pornography. As a child of the 80s, that was there in my life. I was curious. I wanted to look at pornography. My problem was... I couldn't find any. I just couldn't find any. Very frustrating for 14-year-old me. But yet today, any kid that's got a smartphone in their pocket has access to the most explicit stuff known to man. And make clear, parents who are out of the loop in this stuff, I live in this world, I, I teach on it, I study it, it's awful. We think of pornography, we think of Playboy, oh, there's a centerfold image. We're talking video. We're talking explicit video of the most disturbing things you could ever imagine available to our kids via every one of our phones. So it is, it is there. Porn addiction in teenagers is both real and it's common. The average age of first-time exposure to porn is about 11 years old. Uh, that's hardcore porn. Average age, 11 years old, first-time exposure to porn. Uh, Chap Clark of the Fuller Youth Institute believes that 60% of our teen boys are addicted to porn. Six zero, sixty percent of our teen boys. And that's not teen boys in a bad part of town. That's teen boys in our churches. Uh, the youth pastor at my home church back in Atlanta, every year he takes about a dozen senior guys and kind of disciples them for a year before they go off to college. And uh, a couple years ago he told me, of those 12 guys, best of the best kids at a large evangelical church in the South, of those 12 kids, he said they want to grow in Jesus, they want to be the right kind of men. Of those 12 boys, 100% of them would say, I have a significant struggle with looking at porn. 
So again, it's not something in the bad part of town. Those kids that know, but it's our kids are going to struggle with this stuff. And so we've got to help them. And the long-term effects are incredibly, incredibly significant. We can talk about it all day long. I do a whole presentation on this. I'm going to recommend you get our app. There's little orange cards under your butts down there again. There's little orange cards. We have an app that's got a lot of free content. We do a whole talk on the impact of pornography. I'd love for you to get that and listen to it. But again, it is huge, the impact it's having on marriages down the road. And young men saying, I'm going to get married and have the girl in my dreams. And I'll finally have a healthy, God-blessed outlet for my sexual desires. I won't have to look at porn anymore. And the porn problem never goes away. Because what they discover is, this girl they married, the girl of the dreams, she expects stuff from him. In order to connect with her, he's got to love her and romance her and press into her heart. And so are young men have learned after a decade of looking at porn as teenagers that sex is easy. It just happens automatically. It requires nothing of me. And so I marry a girl and she requires stuff of me. Many of our young men, newlywed guys, are saying it's just not worth the effort. It's just not worth the effort. And I go back to porn. It's happening everywhere. These are your kids in the future if we don't give them guidance and give them help. A couple more things. The rally of online predators. Um, we need to teach our kids you never know who you're talking to, and that's a reality. Uh, if you're online, you don't know the person in real life, you don't know who that is. Any game or app with a chat feature is risky. My uh, six-year-old granddaughter was on my phone the other day. She's playing this little art game that you get to like make art, draw pictures and stuff. And other people can vote on it, how much they like. She's interacting online on my phone on a kid's app with other people she doesn't know. Do you think online predators are all over that kind of app that want to connect with our kids? And we certainly are. So settings, that kind of stuff, make sure your kids are, are guarded up what they're on. And have us talk about this stuff regularly. Talk about it often with your kids. Don't be stupid online, for sure. Now, I want to show you one more video. I found this just the other day. Excuse me, I found this this morning. I was having breakfast this morning in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was on Hulu and saw this Dateline special, 30-minute long thing, about what now scammers are doing to our teenage boys. And I know this is real because it happened to a friend of mine. Watch this little clip real quick here. Not the best video, but it's, it's helpful to watch so, and know. I have a bunch of nicknames. Jordan's an unforgettable person, even if nothing had happened. They threatened to send one explicit photo of Jordan to my family. It was a random account and looked like a teenage girl. I was panicked. The perpetrator will solicit some type of compromising sexual image to extort the victim. These people are professional con artists. Every day I told my son I loved him. And in 19 and a half hours, they convinced him otherwise. It's a mind game. The enemy's coming through the wires, and they're coming straight into your kids' bedrooms. Just the day before Jordan was targeted, the FBI had issued a nationwide press release warning of an explosive increase in the financial sextortion of boys. That caught the eye of the Marquette Sheriff's Department. They were able to get her phone and follow the IP address. At that point, it's a matter of officers starting to follow the breadcrumbs. Detectives now working with the FBI subpoenaed records from Instagram and zeroed in on Jordan's conversations with Danny Roberts. That had kicked off with a simple message saying they had friends in common. He responded and they started chatting with each other. What they do is they gain trust. Danny eventually eliciting an explicit picture. He said, is this a scam? He actually asked the scammer and they, no, no, of course. And then he did send the compromising photo and that's when everything changed instantly. So this is the moment of went from flirty to you're being sextorted. We Skip that. So this, this very thing happened to a friend of mine. And this video that I watched this morning on TV, two boys described their story, the parents described their story. In six hours, this extortion thing happened to this popular kid. Within six and a half hours, he shot himself. He said, I can't face the shame of this going public. Ended his life because the stress that was unable to manage as a teenager. Now, my good friend in Tennessee, he called me up about six months ago and said, you never believe what happened to my son, this very thing. 
friend of a friend, hey, started interacting, cute girl, I'll show you mine if you show me yours type of thing, put a picture of himself online, suddenly this extortion started. And this boy was close enough to his dad, they can go to his dad's dad, I've, I've done something foolish, and talk to his dad about it. And they called the police, and they, they reeled it back in. And the dad extended some grace and guided that son to, to veterans. But this kind of thing's happening crazy around our nation right now. And so, again, our, guys, our kids have got to be aware this is possible. This can happen. One more issue is the multiplied impact of poor decisions. Everything our kids do that is wrong or boneheaded is amplified. Uh, one thing that happened simply uh, years ago would just happen, there it was, but now if someone documents it or takes a picture of it or shares it online and goes viral, everything is amplified. Anything done online can come back to haunt you. That's why we give our kids the, the digital footprint conversation often, which means basically anything you do, anything you post, anything you say digitally, anything you share with someone privately, assume it's going to go public and it will follow you. We've got to believe that's true. You guys remember our, four or five years ago, Brett Kavanaugh was being nominated to be our Supreme Court Justice. Remember this? And there was deliberations in that uh, congressional hearing place for day after day after day over Brett Kavanaugh's one little half-page section of his yearbook that had some things written in it that was being questioned. Because in his yearbook from 30 years ago, it brought his life into question. Can you imagine what our kids are going to face and the digital stuff's going to follow them? Pictures they've posted, things they've shared that they don't want to reflect them fully as adults. So make your kids aware. Whatever you put online can be seen by everybody eventually. Don't be stupid. Well, let's dip into help for parents. I want to show you a video one more time. i got lots of videos here to keep things interesting because I'm just boring and these videos are more fun than I am. This is a video clip for what not to do. Everything I just shared scares you to death. What are we going to do? Here's a video clip of what not to do. And this is from a movie that I cannot recommend you watch. This is a movie called This is 40 by Judd Aptow. Do not watch this movie, but this clip is awesome. I love this clip. So this is what not to do. A mom and a dad trying to reel in their kids' online Another lives. Thing that decided is to cut back on all of the electronics we use. Basically, what we're going to do is get rid of the Wi-Fi, and only use the computer what? from 8 to 8.30 at night. How are we going to go on the computer? We're going to have a hard line in the kitchen. Yeah, we'll supervise that. You can't do this. You can't take away the Wi-Fi. No Wi-Fi. Ha, ha, ha. You don't spend enough time with the family when you're constantly on your iPhone and your computer. And, you know, you should, you're should. you only here for five more years. So you won't see me after five years? No, but you won't be living with us. And you should get to know your little sister. You've got the perfect friend right here. I don't want to be friends with her now. I'll be friends with her when she's 20 and a normal person. I don't want to hang out with her when I'm in my 20s. You're on the computer too much as it is. You need to get outside more. Do some playing outside. Yeah, you can build things. out. You could build a, a fort outside. What? Yeah, build a fort. Play with your friends and have... Make a fort outside? Yeah. And do what? Have little... Do what in the fort? When I was a kid, we used to build tree houses and play with sticks. Nobody plays with sticks. You and Charlotte can have a lemonade stand. Play kick the can. Look for dead bodies. That's fun. That's fun to do. Get a tire and then just take a stick and run down a street with it. Nobody does that crap. It's 2012. You don't need technology. No technology. Charlotte, put that down. I don't need to be monitored all the time. On the computer. I don't do anything bad. Nobody said you were bad. I don't do things I'm not supposed to. I don't illegally download music. No. I don't look at porn like Wendy. She is up to no good. She's not allowed to come over here anymore. What's porn? No, she said corn. This isn't turning out the way I wanted it to. I'm not hungry. No computer. Listen to your mom. I need to use it for my homework. She's out playing us. Anybody have a conversation like that at your house? and go by like that? She's yeah, that doesn't out. work very well. All right, here's some help for parents. What we need to be doing. Here's a couple of things to consider to start with. Number one, carefully consider when to give your child a phone. Uh, there is a great rule of thumb that says put it off as long as you possibly can. Wait, 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 wait. If you think you can wait any longer, wait longer if you can. Uh, wait as long as you can. Uh, there's a website called Wait Until 8th that we love that recommends not starting until about 8th grade for a smartphone with all the options and all the bells and whistles. There's a good argument for that because 
legally, websites can't collect information from anybody over the age of, under the age of 13. So again, eighth grade is probably about the right spot to consider there. But that's just a thought. Put it off as long as you can. But bottom line is this. Be the parent. You can say no. Everyone else, you can say no if you want to. You're the parent. You take responsibility for you and don't apologize for that. Um, another thing, stay up to date on popular apps with young people. Obviously, this too is exhausting. We can talk about all the apps our kids are using. They're on YouTube. They're on Reddit. They're on TikTok ad nauseum. They're texting like crazy. That's where our kids are online. They're probably using some app right now that we in this room don't know about yet. That's just the way our kids operate, right? So again, stay up to date on that stuff. Just Google if you have to. Figure out what our kids are doing and be on top of it. <clears throat> Prepare your kids for rules and then enforce them. Make it clear, bottom line, this is your phone, not theirs. That's a big, important deal there, parents. You give your kid a first phone, make very clear. This is not, don't make a mistake, this is not your phone. This is my phone. That I'm allowing you to use and be a steward of. And so again, because it's my phone that you're using, I can look at my phone anytime I want to. <clears throat> Whatever account you're on, I get to know your passwords. Whatever social media apps you're on, I'm going to follow you and stay connected with you that way. Make sure your kids know that, that this belongs to you. Utilize a family contract with a great idea. I'll recommend that more a little bit. We'll talk about. And then create family's charging station for evenings. This is a great rule of thumb. Moms and dads, <clears throat> if you can create a place in your kitchen or a family area that's a family charging station and everyone knows the phones go in there at 6.30 every night and they stay in there. Now, does it mean you can't look at your phone? No, you can walk by and look at your phone, check on something. Sure, there's no rules against that. But we're just not going to be focused here on our phones nonstop all the time. It's a great idea to have. <clears throat> it's also a good idea probably not to have a phone in a bedroom at night. Uh, your kids will say, well, I need my phone in my room at night. I need it for my alarm clock. You know, they make these things they sell at Walmart called alarm clocks. They've been working great for at least 20 years, maybe longer than that. I don't know. Keep going. Hey, utilize filtering and monitoring tools to protect your kids. I think... It's wise to have some kind of technology that manages the content that comes through your home. Now, obviously, there's ways around that, places to circumvent it, sure. But take a first step and do something to govern and monitor what your kids are doing on their phones. Hey, know that your kids might be sneaky. Your kids know about all the stuff that I'm telling you right now. So they create separate ghost accounts. They have the Instagram account that mom and dad know about. Then they have the other Instagram account that only their friends know about. They hide apps in hidden folders. They have a little fake GPS locations. That's actually an app now where you can fake your GPS location. Um, social media on a web browser. Yeah, if you take away, I'm taking away Instagram. I'm removing Instagram from your phone. They can get on Safari or get on Google and get on Instagram. It's really amazing. Uh, burner phones, you know, you can go down to the store and buy a $30 phone at CVS or Walgreens and do all the things we're talking about right now, even if you take away their phone. Uh, all kinds of things our kids do. They're sneaky. Be aware of that. Hey, intentionally set up any phone or device you give your kids. Do not give your kids a smartphone out of the box. Hey, I just got it from the store, shrink wrapped off. Here it is. Plug it in, charge it. It's yours. Go online, Google, and I get our, we have some tools and resources that will guide you through this process of setting up a phone so it's kid friendly. What apps they can download, what apps they can't, what they can get on, what they can't. Adult privileges breaking off, all kinds of stuff. Set up your phone accordingly for your kids. <clears throat> Utilize a contract. I mentioned that earlier. A whole lot of options for that. Go online to Common Sense Media. They've got a great one. Our resources have got one as well. Take advantage of contracts. I consider talking about porn with even your youngest children. When my kids were young and we had the birds and bees talk, in the next two minutes after the birds and bees talk, I was very clear, there's a whole big, ginormous, and profitable industry showing people doing what I just described to you. And it is not for you. It will mess you up. Talk about it early and often. This book's good pictures and bad pictures are a great little conversation starter, even for young children. Uh, talk about the negative impact of phones on our lives. Just say, here's the, the dangers of it. It's shiny, and it's pretty, and it's wonderful, and it's good, but there's more to it than that. It is destroying an entire generation. It's changing a worldview. It's getting kids addicted to porn. It's helping kids not able to be able to engage socially with people in a right and healthy way because they've checked out on real relationships and settled for this. 
So again, have those conversations with your kids. Talk about the impact of this stuff on your kids. Look for every opportunity to help your kids be educated on these issues. Because their peers are not talking about it. You as their parents have the responsibility to know what you know and make sure your kids know more than they know right now. You've got to teach and train them. Call it technological discipleship, if you will. This device that our kids have in their pockets has the chance to destroy their lives. We want to help it make so it's not so and doesn't happen that way. Um, let me make a shameless plug, and I want to get into discussion as much as we can. We do have a tool that we created, the Smartphones 101 thing. Again, there's little black cards. Uh, Smartphones 101 is a 10-part video series we created during COVID lockdown. Just like you, we were staring at the walls for about a year. What do we do with our time? How do we leverage this for good? And so we created a 10-part little video series, eight, nine-minute long videos that you watch with your kids, print out a little document, take some notes, and talk about the impact of all these things. It covers a lot of the ground that I covered this evening very quickly. But it makes it so that you can tee up those conversations and not have to be the bad guy. Because when you try to have those conversations on your own and be the authority, it can sometimes feel like they're not hearing you. Or they go, la, 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 or just don't want to listen to what you're saying. Use me as the bad guy on that. Let me show you a little video again. I've got one more video. It's kind of a promo of that. I'm going to skip over some stuff at the end. There are a little last minute things that we've got for, uh, for our conclusion. Leveraging tech for good. We're going to skip all that just for fun. Here's my little uh, promo video here. And I'll show you just for grins. Here it is right there. Smartphones have changed absolutely everything in our world. How do we ever function before these things? If you're a parent of a child, you're probably already hearing the earlier refrains of, when can I get a phone? When can I have a phone? Or if you're a parent of a teenager, you probably are giving them a phone and you worry about what they're encountering. It's probably one of the biggest struggles of parenthood knowing our kids need these, but there's so much garbage they can encounter on them. The, the information they get, the impact it has in their brains, the way it exposes them to content that you're not sure of, or even online predators. You wanna give your kid a phone, but have some knowledge that they're gonna be safe using that phone. My name is Barrett Johnson. I lead an organization called Imperfect and Normal Families Only. That's probably you. We're all a little bit imperfect, but you're looking for ways to equip and help your kids navigate a culture that's kind of crazy, but to navigate it with wisdom. And as a parent who's raised four young adult kids, I know that helping them navigate this world was one of the biggest challenges of my parenthood. That's why we've created a digital course called Smartphones 101, the basics of smartphone use. It's designed for parents who are about to give their kid a first smartphone, or maybe even for parents and families who have kids who have had a phone for a few years, but you're still trying to figure out how to help them to use it with wisdom. The course includes everything from the impact of smartphones on our brains to uh, social media and the depression and anxiety that can come along with that. Online bullying and uh, pornography and the things that are encountered that are not so good for them. And so our course, Smartphones 101, is designed to help a family to walk through all the dimensions of smartphones and the change that's brought to our lives and to guide you through it to have key conversations about how to do this right. The course has 10 concise video lessons you can watch together with your kids, and hopefully I'll be the bad guy that will tee up some critical conversations you need to have about the impact of smartphones in their lives. There's notes to take, supportive documents, all kinds of resources to help you be smart with your smartphones. If you're curious, just click on the link below to find out more information about smartphones. One oh, link below, but you got me. Uh, so again, that's a tool that we created during pandemic. And if you want to go home and talk this stuff about your kids, it's probably a great place to start educating your kids on this stuff. Uh, it's all online. You just download a code for me. Uh, it's typically 39 bucks online, but it's 25 bucks a day. And I'll give you one of our books for free over there uh, if you want to grab that. So it's just a resource, shameless plug on that. Uh, Again, uh, Talks is a book we have that guides parents to how to have conversations about sexuality. Young Man's Guide to Awesome is a book for teenage boys, a short, little easy read book. Helps teen boys understand what it means to be men of purity, and then also one for teen girls as well. So some of the tools we have there. Jeff, do we have questions? We're going to cover what y'all want to talk about. We do have one. Uh, does anybody have a question? Jeff's got cards. What do we not do? This was awful fast and furious and covered a lot of ground. What are you dealing with in your home? Well, let's do this. Here's a great way of responding, Jeff. Let me give you an idea here. Don't say, here's the question I have about my kids. Frame it this way. A family I know is dealing with this issue. Just uh, do it that way. That way it's not all on you. Jeff, what do you got? Yeah, I was going to grab my uh, smartphone here, Barrett. No, you can't um, use a smartphone, Jeff. It's an evil tool. Um, do I want to make sure we, we get some from sure, Jersey sure. Village and North Klein if yep. they text them in. Here's, here's the first one. Is there any reason... A child under the age of 18 
should have social media? You know, I, not a great reason, um, but there's some reasons. I heard somebody say, when do you give your kids social media? Well, whatever age you want your kid to start dealing with self-esteem, uh, start being tempted to be looking at some things you don't look at, all those different, that's the age you want them to start that, that's the age you give them social media. Okay, so that's the negative parts of all that. We've got to face the realities to the parents, though, that this is, these are the platforms that our kids are using to interact with their peers. And if you say to a 16-year-old kid, you can't have social media. Again, if you want to make that argument, I, I'm not saying you're a bad parent. You're probably a very good parent. Uh, there are a couple of uh, celebrity parents. Jennifer Garner, I think, has done that and, and brags about that. Which Go Jennifer Garner. But I do know it's the way our kids interact with their peers. And so, again, it, the, the compelling reasons to have it is that is the platform of engagement. That is a place they interact. So that's the reason to have it. There are all kinds of negative viewpoints of it as well. So, again, if you're going to do it to kids that are younger, 14, 15, 16, which, again, if you can put it off as long as you can, you've got to make sure as a parent you are educating and training and teaching and putting some governors in place that monitor some of that. Okay. Uh, Stephanie, I'm going to hand you this microphone and you. let you uh, take that. Go, Stephanie. Hi. How young is too young to talk to your child about porn? Uh, there's, there's not a too young age. Again, that Good Pictures, Bad Pictures book, there's a version of that kind of for elementary age. There's a, a junior version that's even younger than that. I, I don't think it's wrong to talk to our kids about something they're going to stumble on and has the real potential to screw up their lives. And every parent goes, well, I don't want to expose them to something that, that, that they're going to be curious about then and then go explore that they didn't know about before. That, that can happen. Okay, that, that's a possibility. But I've been doing this ministry for 10 years or so, and all those 10 years, I get phone calls from parents all the time who are dealing with kids exposed to the most horrific porn on the planet. I've had hundreds of those calls. And all my time, I've had two conversations with parents who say, I shared porn, excuse me, I shared about porn with my kids too young, and they got curious and stumbled onto it. That's happened twice when I've got hundreds of examples of parents who did not talk about it young enough. So again, I think five, six years old, you can tell a kid, hey, if you ever see someone with their clothes off, that's not for you. It's as easy as it is. They come across it on a computer, hey, close the computer. You come across it on a phone somewhere, put it down, come tell me. Always come tell me. But I think you can have that conversation with the youngest, youngest child. There's no reason not to do that. All right, Stephanie, I'll, I'll do one from North Klein, and then I'll kick it back to you. North Klein has the best questions, in my opinion, Jeff. You know, that's what I've heard. Uh, you mentioned monitoring, monitoring software and hardware. Are there any specific ones that you would recommend? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, here's a one general philosophy. When your kids are young, go with filter. As they get older, move to accountability. So, for example, you can filter explicit content with things like Canopy, with things like Circle is a great little tool. Uh, Net Nanny has a, a device that kind of manages all of that that's pretty good. But then there's a device like uh, app like Covenant Eyes, which a lot of faith-based organizations support, and it's more of an accountability thing where you can go look at stuff, but if you see stuff, your friend that's getting emails every week of what you're seeing online will know about that. So I think it's great to, as your kids move into teenage years to move away from pure filtering to accountability because I don't want to just block everything for my teenage boy, him at 19 years old, move out on his own, and he hasn't learned to exercise the muscles involved in governing himself. I want to learn how to govern himself. So those are great. Um, Bark is one that's more kind of the Gestapo secret police of apps. If your concern, your teenager is sending inappropriate messages or giving, Bark is kind of all encompassing, covers a lot of ground of being able to monitor everything in there. But for just content, Circle's great. Uh, Canopy is great. Uh, Net Nanny's okay. Uh, but again, just Google and try some of your best that you think are out there. All of them are good. What personal boundaries do you have with your phone or technology? I want to ask him, what personal boundaries? Uh -huh. I wonder what that question means. What does like, that mean? what do you personally use to protect your phone, to protect your technology? I think the, big, the biggest thing that I do is open accountability on my device. Here, here's a line I heard my friend Rob Reno share. You met Rob before, I think. Rob's great. Rob says this, none of us are holy enough for a private online life. Love that. And so the biggest thing I do parameter-wise is accountability. I tell my wife, you can have my phone anytime you want it. 
She likewise to me. I, she has all my passwords, knows what stuff is. There's no secrets on a phone. If in a marriage, for example, let's we'll talk about marriage here, there's part, hey, you can't look at that part of my phone. That's just, I'm waving red flags like nobody's business. And from the earliest age, educate your kids likewise. Hey, your phone is my phone. I can look at it anytime I want to. I wonder if that's the question. That Thank you. Me. All right, good. All right. Jeff? Here's one from Jersey Village. How often should you be checking your teen's phone and then follow up? How do you navigate respecting privacy but also providing accountability to your team? Yeah, I think privacy is uh, privacy or independence in that area is earned over time when you see patterns of behavior. So when you see your kids show their meeting expectations on when you are looking over their shoulder a little bit and checking on what they're doing online, when you're doing that at times and they're showing to be faithful and good and not doing stupid things online, then of course every other department of parenting, you give them more freedom, you give them more privileges within that space. And I think again, uh, that happens our kids move towards getting older. I think there's not a place for a whole lot of independence and freedom for a 14-year-old. 14-year-olds are by definition stupid, right? So they're just still learning what's right and what's wrong and what's the right thing to do. So oversight, there's got to be there. But I think, again, 16, 17, 18, preparing them to launch them to independence, I think you start looking for ways to give them more freedom as they're being responsible with that. Now, practical question, how often do you check your kid's phone? I just do it as a spirit leads. You know, I believe there's a God that loves me and a God that wants to lead me and speak to me and guide me in all things. And so I just sometimes have moments where I go, hey, Maddie, let me look at your phone. Or she'll leave it somewhere. I'll just get on it. I'll be nosy. I'll just get on her phone. And so respecting privacy in that department for a 16-year-old, it doesn't exist at that time. As she gets older and shows more independence, then we do that. Super. Barrett. Yes, ma'am. We have older teenagers, someone says, and we have not done anything that you have told us to do so far. <laughs> and we are trying to make up for lost time. What tips do you have for us uh, parents who have older teenagers? Yeah. It's, it's never too late to start doing right things. And so if a parent says, hey, we've done a bad job of this, we got to reset. I would encourage just kind of a family meeting of parents saying, you know what, we, we feel like we've dropped the ball on being good parents to you. And you're not going to like this very much. We've done a bad job of kind of supervising technology. So we're going to kind of push the reset button and we're going to kind of make some new guidance and some new rules and see how we operate in that. None of them are in stone. We're going to figure it out as we go along, but we've got to create some boundaries and some parameters and guidance for how we're going to manage technology in our home. And it's going to look a little different than it's looked because we haven't done much at all. It may be a great chance, again, this Smartphones 101 course we created to say, hey, as a family, let's, let's sit down every Tuesday night for the next 10 weeks and, and go through this thing just to tee up some conversations so kids, you know it's not just mom and dad are crazy, is that there are people who know what they're talking about at some level who say these things are worth knowing and, and adjusting. And, and by the way, the, the smartphone is one of course. If you've got an elementary, middle school kid that you know down the road is going to get a smartphone, the best thing you can do with them is say, when that time comes, hey, we feel like for your birthday in April, we're going to give you your first smartphone. We're really praying about that. That's what we're going to do, I think. But before we do that, you're going to have to sit down with us and watch this course. Let's go through 10 videos for 20 minutes of time with us before you get your phone. Before you get the phone. That's the most strategic time in the world to do it because that kid who wants that phone, who's been begging for that phone for the last 12 years, they'll say, let's watch them right now. Let's go. I'll do whatever you want. I'll do whatever you want me to do, mom and dad, to get that phone. Okay? They're motivated at that time. So again, but again, if parents are too late, push the reset button, start over. You've addressed this a little bit, but parents here want to know, what age do you recommend to give children a cell phone? Again, my daughter had a $15 phone from CVS. There was a flip phone that she could call us on. And she had that at 12 years old. And she kept it in her pocket and didn't let anybody see it because she was embarrassed of it. Rightly so. Totally get it. <laughs> but she could reach us when she needed to reach us, and I could reach her. And that was handy, okay? So again, that's, that's, a, that's a safety measure for young children, for parents who want that. Totally get that. If you want to start introducing smartphone stuff to your kids, there's phones like the Gab phone. Look that up, G-A-B-B. -B. It's a smartphone that's very limited in what it does. It's a great thing to give to small kids, or not small kids, middle schoolers. Because it looks like a phone, it does a few key things, just doesn't open up the Wild West to your, your kids, okay? So again, as far as giving a full-on iPhone to a kid, I would not do it in this day and age before 13 years old. I, just my opinion, 
You can disagree with me. That's fine. I, I'm not the ultimate authority on this, but that's what I would say. Super. This is a great question. Is there anything that we can do to influence the authorities to do something against the people who are pro promoting and producing pornography? For the authorities, like, uh -huh. like a, a governmental level? Yes. You could try. <laughs> Much of the space we teach in and work in our ministry is related to the hypersexualization of our culture. Um, and, and it's been moving like a big tidal wave tsunami in the wrong direction for the last 20 years or so. Can we all agree? And so that momentum in our culture and our world are government. I mean, vote for the right people. Encourage folks and authorities to, to kind of lock down on things and put parameters in place. Certainly, school board meetings go to them. There's been a whole big movement of pornographic books and schools available to our elementary schools happening right now. Um, they're out there. Go to those meetings. You know, we got to be on top of that stuff. But but more so than than trying to stop that, we've got to recognize as the body of Christ, we're going to be different in this world than most of the world is, and we're going to think differently. You've got to train your kids. More importantly, more importantly than having some big movement to stop at a governmental level is training our kids to operate differently in a world that's going to hell in a handbasket. Can I say hell in a handbasket from the stage, Jeff? I just did. Too okay. late. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, th th again, train your kids to operate differently and to think differently. That's, that's more the goal. Okay. So we as parents are using social media ourselves. And so does that give our children the idea that it's okay? Um, sure. I, I, uh, I don't know. I do a lot of things that an adult that my kids aren't allowed to do yet. I, I drive a car, and my 13-year-old is not allowed to. It's not okay for her. I think it's okay to tell kids, hey, there's certain things that are, uh, I've got to be on guard of, and how this impacts me as well, but I've got to be on guard of it. I want to guard your heart and your mind as well in significant ways in doing that. So I, I think, you know, obviously our kids are watching us. They're learning how to do technology by watching our example. So we've got to be a good example, obviously. Thank you so My much pleasure. for being My here pleasure. tonight. Our Give pleasure. it up for Barrett. We My appreciate pleasure. you. And parents, we want to encourage you. Get on these websites that he's recommended. Get the information. Get the videos, please. Okay, because we really do need to guard our children. And so on behalf of Champion Forest, I would just like to say to you, we love you. We are behind you. We are supporting you. If there's anything that we can do to encourage you, pray with you, let us know because we are here for you. So let me pray for us before we go. Father, I thank you so much for Barrett, for his research, for this passion that you have put in his heart and for bringing him here tonight. And God, I pray in the name of Jesus over every child, over every student that is represented here tonight. God, we pray that you will protect their minds, guard their hearts and their minds in you, Jesus. We pray that you will guard them from addiction, from pornography. God, and I pray tonight for every parent that is sitting here that you will give them the power, the strength, the courage to stand in your truth, to do what is right and best for the children and students that you have given to them. And that, God, you will move in our families in a powerful way so that we will turn our eyes from the things of this world and set our hearts and our minds and our eyes on you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Be sure to check out the resources here at the table. And thank you for being here tonight.